Okay, let's run. Your mission, should you choose to accept it. It's a quest. It's a quest for fun. Well, The Rock says, why don't we just cut right to the chase? Okay, now he, uh, you know, he wants to get together. Well, you know, he wants to talk. I want you to do me a favor. I want you to tell all your friends about me. It's showtime, folks! What are you? I'm... Greetings and salutations. Welcome to And I Quote, the weekly show where we introduce you to content creators of all shapes and sizes that join us from many and all corners of the nerd universe. We find out more about them and take your questions. I am your host, Ryan of Nerd Culture, and our guest this week is comic book veteran extraordinaire. He's been there and done that with pretty much every name under the sun, DC, Marvel, independent titles, not so independent titles, and even Moonshine Bigfoot, but we'll talk more about that later. Please welcome from Denver, Colorado, the mile high city of the US of A, please welcome Zach Howard to the stage. Zach, how are you, big man? Hello, how's it going, man? It's going well, it's going well. I'm glad that you're here and we're happy that you're with us. Now, if you have any questions for Zach Howard as we go throughout the course of this episode of And I Quote, make sure you leave it in the chat, leave it in the comments. We would love to hear from you. Also, do not forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends because they are going to like the way they look after watching or listening to this episode of And I Quote. We guarantee it. Zach Howard, first first up for you, how were you specifically introduced to the world of comics? Um... You mean like my origin story, like when I was a kid type stuff? Or... Exactly. Going all the way back to the beginning. Roger that. So I I grew up on military bases kind of around the world. So it was hard for me to get exposed to comic books, uh, actual literal comic books. So uh, when I lived in a place called Karlsruhe, Germany, as a, a the base next to this cool castle on the Rhine River, all I could get in Germany was uh, uh, 2000 AD. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, obviously Conan the Barbarian, but the magazine, like kind of like EU edition sizes. So that was just comic books to me growing up. So all I did was uh, try and draw Conan chopping people's arms off. Uh, and then my my other super young friend, family friendly title was Judge Dredd. So I kind of grew up with those. Um, and uh, yeah, I had kind of limited exposure and I just would try and recreate the drawings myself. You know, while I was just sitting there in a TLQ on a military base in Germany during the Cold War. So, yeah, it was just kind of like a independent venture of my own getting into comic books. Goodness gracious. Well, bonus question when it comes to the character of Judge Dredd. Which, which was your favorite iteration, the Stallone or the Carl Urban version? <laughs> in break the law. In the law. Uh, no, I'd have to say the Carl Urban one. And the cool thing is my cover... Uh, the relaunch for Judge Dredd in America, the cover I did for that, if you watch the DVD extras, like the history of Judge Dredd, they used that image for the introduction to Judge, to Judge Dredd. So that was kind of a cool little feather in my cap from my childhood. I get uh, the history of Judge Dredd has my crap right on the front. Oh, my goodness. I'm going to have to go back and watch that because I do have the Dread with Carl Urban on Blu-ray. So I'm going to have to look that up. It's in there. Look at the, There's like a DVD extra. You'll see it. Uh, pretty cool. I think Chris Ryle, my old editor, is uh, well, actually, the editor of Moonshine Bigfoot, uh, the guy I did Shaun of the Dead with back in the day. He's he's uh, uh, talking on the video about it. So pretty cool. My goodness gracious, that is really good stuff. Any other, or do you have any, I should say, favorite comic book writers or artists, past or present? Oh, geez. Um, uh, well, artists is easy. Writers, I would say, the first one. Uh, obviously old school Frank Miller did it for me. Uh, 90s Mignola, uh, Mobius was hit and miss for me, but always, always beautiful. Sorry if you can hear my dogs. Um, they're, they're fighting the UPS man, which is pretty intense fight. Um, but, uh, <laughs> they're good at it. Um, but, uh, 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 writers right now, I'd say Mike Rach, who I did, He's the most underrated badass that I know. Uh, he did uh, uh, Wild Blue Yonder with me, which is my most popular indie title that, that I created, I guess, uh, my original uh, property. Uh, and then Joe Hill, obviously, uh, Stephen King's son of Lock and Key fame. 
uh, Black Phone, the movie that just came out. He's just a phenomenal writer. I did uh, The Cape with him in 2010, and that was, I think, the only time I got a real serious Eisner nod. That was, uh, uh, I guess, the I think it was 2010, best single issue or whatever uh, like that, which was pretty cool. Came with a lot of accolades, but working with those two writers, I'd say, are technically my favorite. Um, though growing up, of course, it was Chris Claremont, probably, once I got it, that X-Men bug in me, is Mark Silvestri and Chris Claremont, and that lit me up for years, years. And uh, uh, so I'd say for my childhood, that would be number one. Also liked Roger Stern because I was a big Hulk fan when I was young. Um, and I got to, when I actually drew a Hulk book in uh, 2009-ish, uh, I, he was actually the writer on it. So that was pretty cool, feather in my cap, working with somebody that was big as a kid, or was big and lit up my childhood. Uh, obviously when I was young artists, I'd say the first name artist I knew was Frank Frazetta. Cause I loved reading the Conan books. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the first guy I knew by name and could just recognize their artwork. Uh, <clears throat> but after that, John Buscema, of course, cause he did Conan, uh, and uh, damn near everything good during my childhood. Um, uh, favorite artist, uh, Oddly enough, I was a Mignola fan even back when he was doing the Hulk covers in like 1986 when he kind of had this plug European style kind of bubbly plug. It was I loved him even back then. Um, and then uh, once I got to Frank Miller uh, when you know Ronan and Sin City and Dark Knight came out, I don't think there was a person that affected me more artistically. I'd say the very first volume of Sin City that was the most seminal piece of artwork that I've ever touched or read, at least in my life. So that would be it. Long rambling answer, but there you go, sir. No, we appreciate the, uh, the answer and the names that you brought up. If someone's interested to learn more about these individuals, now they have some names that they can go for oh. or go to and learn more about it. Just out of curiosity though, when you mentioned the title known as the Cape, does that have any relation to the short lived TV series that was on NBC? Fortunately, no, it's not uh, a so okay. that that's just an unfortunate that came out like six months after we made the cape, and it was all people. Unfortunately, they always supersede uh, TV trash with uh, comic book trash, so mm. that was just unfortunate. You, I mean, that you can't copyright something called the cape, you know, mm. like it, it was called poison, you can't copyright that, you know, just certain words you can't or phrases that. You just can't copyright. So, unfortunately, that disaster. Uh, well, I used to get asked a lot. This is the first time in a while because that came out what in like 2010 or something. Yeah, like it was. So, it was like 13 uh, years ago now. Yeah, pretty pretty rough stuff. But I get it. It was on mainstream TV uh, and uh, uh, has the same name, so it's very. I would say if you've never read Joe Hill. Uh, Get ready. There's a reason we got nominated for book of the year on that one. Uh, that was one of them that we were about halfway through with the first issue. It was originally a one shot and I was halfway done with it and they made it a mini series because it was already some every once in a while you work on something you can tell you have lightning in a bottle. And that was one of the projects within pages where like, holy crap, this is this is gonna be something. Um, and it did. And it, it, hell, I still get royalty checks. The it's never not been in hardcover since 2009 or 2010 when it, it got collected. Uh, and I don't have a property that never got translated into any other medium than a hardcover book. So obviously that one's been successful. It's been optioned many times by movies, and it looks like we got a a real one coming up. But I can't talk about it yet about the cape. So keep your eye. Oh, Joe's peeled. Keep. Keep them peeling. Keep them open. Keep <laughs> I'll be sure to I'll be sure to keep that in mind. And once again, we are talking with comic book veteran Zach Howard here on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Zach, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. I'd be more than happy to hear from you. Whether you're watching this live or on the replay, thank you for being with us. With that being said, what are some of your other favorite comic book movies or TV series, past or present? Oh, gosh. Uh uh, movies, obviously. I, growing up in Germany, we didn't have TV or really even access to movies. It, they'd like come a year later in, in the military theater and there'd only be one movie. Uh, so you didn't get to really take part in that level of pop culture, new releases and things like that. 
um, like Robotech launched while I was in, mm-hmm. in traveling, all the fun things. The only thing I got to see was I was there for like the first two months. I was in the U.S., first two months of Transformers. So I got to got to catch that train early and showed up in Germany with the only one with actual Transformers toys. So I was quite popular there for about six months um, uh, having Optimus Prime. But uh, um, I'd say Conan the Barbarian, the movie, uh, my parents probably shouldn't have let me watch that when I was eight, but I did. And uh, uh, you got to remember, I'm Gen X, man. They, they a latchkey kid in the military. We, we didn't get, we saw our parents like late supper time. That's the only time we saw it. So what would happen in Germany is you'd get a lot of blank VHSs and you would start trading movies and you'd have all these VHSs that would have three movies on them. And uh, you and your friends would just trade them and, the movies that were in that like uh, VHS kind of uh, community, those are the movies you memorized. Like uh, I have Conan the Barbarian memorized, Alien memorized, uh, goofy, goofy stuff like uh, Revenge of the Nerds. That one didn't age well, but uh, you just, a lot of those movies that came out uh, like 84 to 86 or 83 to 86, we that's all we had on videos. So those are probably very influential to me. Uh, John Milius making uh, Conan the Barbarian ended up befriending some of the artists that made the movie, which was really exciting. Um, uh, influenced me a lot as a storyteller in all aspects of that uh, uh, story and how they translated that to uh, a movie uh, because it, it doesn't translate well. You can look at a lot of uh, comic book stuff that's been tried to turn into a movie and you can just tell they didn't figure out how to change it into a specific medium they're trying to it's a delicate formula and that's why there's you'll see like a couple like one or two really good superhero movies and then everybody else is just trying to rip them off because the formula is so hard translating that medium from comic books to movies and or tv um uh, but uh conan definitely did it uh, and then movies like road to perdition definitely did it though much easier uh, translating a crime noir uh, than say like Hellboy, you know that's that's a hard world to create um, and make work in movies. I think I'm rambling a bit, but uh, I'd say that's uh, I'd say Conan the Barbarian, Ghostbusters, um, uh, Alien, uh, the first two Alien and Aliens, way different movies, both brilliant in their own right. Uh, but movies of that elk, probably the best movie I think, pound for pound out there it was indiana jones when uh, the first one when i when i start building a story with a writer i try to use that pacing uh like if you see wild blue yonder we use the indiana jones pacing um Mm -hmm. for that uh for you know even though it has nothing to do with indiana jones that movie's so flawless uh raiders of the lost ark you can learn a lot structure pacing how long you make a scene if you have a negative scene, how you balance it with a more positive character scene afterwards, I think that movie is pretty flawless. Um, and of course, I grew up, you know, young, so I saw all three original Star Wars in their theaters, um, in the theater, albeit I was quite young, the first one. Uh, the next two I have distinct memories of seeing, though. Um, so I'd say all those classics that came out about that time seemed to... Uh, permeate my skull and they they reside uh in my brain still because that's what i i mean even for moonshine bigfoot we're calling back to uh americana between 75 to probably 83 or something like that uh uh, Mm -hmm. that that kind of magical innocent era of art production post vietnam so post deer hunter so it's not quite as sad Right, right. Good picks, man. You know, it's interesting. It's interesting you bring up Indiana Jones because I was just rewatching, uh, and I'm in the process of. St- I haven't finished it yet, but I'm still in the process of rewatching uh, the Last Crusade. Yeah. Because I did things in reverse. I grew up watching Last Crusade, and then I went back and watched the other ones, including Raiders of the Lost Ark. Which, great. I mean, both that and Last Crusade are just incredible. Yeah. I'm in a big Temple right. of Doom fan. I mean, I, I I absolutely love that movie. I know it gets a little. Hey, I've never understood why. Ooh, boo. Sorry. Ooh. Not it's a okay. Of- it's okay. You might like Aquaman, and I'll have to take a dump on him later. So uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. it's well, all good, and I get it because the tone is different. 
But in, a, in as an individual movie, I think it works brilliantly, and okay. I really enjoyed it. Though, to your point, it ain't it ain't the other two. No, it's and not. I just I never even saw the fourth one. I saw the trailer for it, and the guy got out of like survived a nuclear blast in a fridge. I was that like, would be out. Indiana Jones did, yeah, yeah, out. I'm out. Okay, I'm out. fair enough. I'm fair out. enough. Fair enough. You, you got to somewhat abide by physical yeah. reality. Yeah, you know, you, you got to have some foundational understanding that these people live in the world that we live in, and mm. even if you have fantastical things, great i.e. The, the, the arc or, or whatever. You know, a guy can rip out your heart uh, with uh, magic stones, whatever. However, mm-hmm. just basic physical laws uh, really irk me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that one looked like a disaster, so I never saw it. I, I uh, love Indiana Jones too much. I couldn't do it. Okay. Well, let me ask you, well, follow-up question. Are you going to yeah. see the retirement film with Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, and the Dial of Destiny? I probably will have to, you know, mm-hmm. I think they're doing it. I think they learned their lesson last film. Don't yep. listen to George Lucas. And, <laughs> uh, and then after that, you got a chance at making a movie that's watchable. Mm-hmm. So, and you got a great director behind this one with James. Yeah. Mangle, so. Yeah. So they got the elements. I think they learned from the last one. Mm-hmm. So, okay. yeah. That's- that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I'm in the process of rewatching Last Crusade on Blu-ray right now because I went to a oh. place uh, where I am uh, in where my studio is, and they had used Blu-rays and DVDs, and they had the set of all four movies on Blu-ray uh, that came out sometime. I mean, they, there have been two different, not two different versions, but two different packagings of the Indiana Jones movies on Blu-ray. There's one with the, that looks like a book, like a flaps of a book that has all four films, including a bonus disc. This one is in a regular Blu-ray case with all four movies, including the bonus feature. So it's not like you get less with a different set. Yeah, it's, just it's less just, superfluous packaging. Yeah, it's different format. But but either way, I got it, and I brought it home, and I've been re-watching Last Crusade, and I'm thinking to myself, so much fun in this movie. It's, really it's pretty flawless as it well. Is so good yeah. and the holy grail is like and you said it yourself there's a so when it comes to and i'm speaking about movies in general sometimes you have to suspend disbelief it's very difficult to do that with kingdom of the crystal skull whereas in uh, raiders of the lost ark and last crusade it feels real like these things could Tangible. actually exist yeah. and these well i mean the ark of the covenant is real and the holy grail to an extent is real but they took creative liberties with it, of course. But at the same time, the Holy Grail to me feels real. Like you can you can get it. You can touch it. I agree yeah. with you. And they don't bring in the magic until the story's at its culmination. And that's mm-hmm. that's part of it where, again, you can you, you got to set your own rules for your story. But once you ground that universe, you got to... Sorry if it, I crapped out. No. It's okay. Yeah, you did cut out, but I think oh, we got okay. you back. Good, good, good. Good, good. Um, I'm going to turn off uh, my ad blockers just in case. Um, yeah, there you go. I got you. But if for those types of stories, you're grounding them in a physical reality that we exist mm-hmm. in. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're going to fantastical elements, that's part of action adventure fantasy. But you can't rely on that as a story, a plot device in a story. Right. Otherwise... It can't be your foundational element, magic, because we live in the real world, an objective reality. So to bring in magic, it almost has to not affect the story. Um, it's revealed at the end that, okay, things aren't quite as you you believe, i.e. when you open the ark, you pull upon old you know, biblical and, and uh, Judeo-Christian text and go punish them all. And it's done in this brilliant, fast, fast horrible uh, uh, uh I mean, it's just, it's a quick scene, and that that's a testament to uh, actual one good thing George Lucas did for that film, is he came back and recut that scene. Spielberg had it twice as long, and he's like, this isn't working. It's because we don't care about the ghost flying around. We care about if Indiana Jones is going to survive that, him and his girl. So oh, Lucas is really good at quick cuts and uh, just, just, just machine gunning you and getting out. And that's what he brought to that scene. And what it did is it stopped, especially nowadays with special effects, they hang on this, hey, look at these cool special effects for five minutes. And that's not the story. So when you're walking, watching Doctor Strange, eventually it just feels like the green screen adventure because everything is magic. Every And you forget 
the story I want to watch is about the damn character and his or her journey and uh, to become a different, you know, usually better person and or save X. And uh, it seems like a lot of movies now are so lost in special effects that we forgot to make a darn movie. And that's why I love things like Indiana Jones, where like, yeah, we got some cool special effects, but the character is fantastic. You don't care if the character's trying to find his pair of shoes to put on and tie the shoelaces. You would still watch it because it's Indiana F and Jones and you want to know what he's doing, you know, mm -hmm. and. I think people forget that, that the character isn't the little magic hands or the, the green screen with the crazy spaceship exploding behind him for five minutes. Very important elements, but we hang on that rather than the story nowadays for most mainstream stuff, especially comic book related. Um, they're more worried about the Easter eggs and the visuals than they are about just making a dynamic character story. If you look at the first Iron Man story, that was a fantastic kind of uh, uh, vignette of a man's life in during his midlife crisis. That's what the story is about. Iron Man was cool when he finally got to see a working Iron Man. Still didn't make the movie. It was the damn character. Hmm. You know, you wanted to see that character win, not because he was Iron Man, but because he became invested in the actual human being behind him uh, or within him. And I think that's where we're really missing out on the more contemporary superhero stuff, or at least things translated from comic books uh, specifically. And I hope we do figure that out as an industry. Because right now it just seems like a cash grab plus, hey, look at this shiny bobble for two hours. Great. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, no one's going to be talking about Ant-Man 3 in 20 years, but they're still going to be talking about Indiana Jones. You mm. know, and I think legacy projects no one's trying to make legacy projects anymore. They're trying to cash in. They're chasing the dragon of money and fame. Uh, but I get it. Well, if you got $200 million and Disney expects you to make $2 billion off of that, there's some sleepless nights in trying to make fans happy. Mm. And uh, that can be a dangerous thing, trying to go after fans' happiness, because that's constantly evolving. Well, welcome to Zach Howard's special <laughs> TED Talk here on this special episode of Bandai <laughs> Quote, where we are talking with comic book veteran known as Zach Howard. And if you have any questions about any – or questions for Zach, I should say, gee whiz, <laughs> let us know uh, in the comments. Let us know in the chat. If you're watching this live or on the replay, thank you so much for being here. And don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. And once again, Zach, thank you for your TED Talk. My, <laughs> my response to that – my response to that, because I do want to segue into something here real quick, but before sure. I get to that, when it comes to making a movie, and this is something I feel, granted, I haven't seen too many of the newer films because I've been watching some of the older stuff. I've been re-watching some classics, such as The Last Crusade. Yes. I realize that when you, when a filmmaker or a team of people, because it takes a team of people to put together a movie, it's a very big production. I feel like something gets lost when you have too much money to play around with. If you have a limited budget and you have to think and think on your feet and put something together, whether it's through storyboarding or you have to put it on a sheet of paper. And by the way, there's no right or wrong way to put together a, uh, your movie or your visuals. It's just a matter of how you get it done. Yeah. Going back to the 80s, because you brought this up earlier with the 1980s. In 1984, there was a film called The Terminator directed by James Cameron. And Perfect. he had a very limited uh, – almost shoestring budget but he made that film work perfectly yeah for what it was doing in terms of telling its story and focusing on the protagonist as well as the antagonist with you know the the t101 and then sarah yeah. connor being on the run from her life because she's being thrown all this stuff at her and she's where where what is all this stuff where is this coming from but at the same time she becomes her own character as the story progresses and that's what I feel in some days. So nowadays, when you have two hundred million dollars to make a film, it's no go back to making films on ten million dollars, just five it's million dollars, one hundred and fifty million dollars of shiny baubles. Yeah, it, well, to a certain degree, you're right. But back in the '80s and other eras of filmmaking, when you had limited budgets and you had a either a short named cast or a big name cast, you made it work, and they you did boiled it well. the fat off the bones, and you found your story. And then you made that story. Sarah Connor self-actualizes during this. She was a lost character. By the end of the movie, she's the hero. 
and that that's her own hero's journey though not strictly with how Campbell did it, but in, in effect, that's our hero's journey. And that's why we're there. We're trying to live vicariously through them. We shouldn't, with through your, your heroes, you shouldn't just be a voyeur. And that's what I feel like in a lot of modern stuff. I'm just, it's voyeurism. Okay, this, this dumb character, The Rock now is pissed off and he has a lightning bolt on his chest and he's going to yell at this famous actor for 20 minutes and then we're going to watch super people gritting their teeth while they're making their hand gestures and uh, flying around. And that's your movie. Whereas to your point, you need a, you need a story about a character that we can identify with. And that's what we lost. We, we want to go on a journey with this person. And if they aren't going on a journey, then who cares? Uh, or if it's a journey, that's just old hat. Like, like I, I watched that Ant mo- uh, Ant Man movie. Sorry, I've only seen so many Marvel movies, and I always use that one as a bad example. All they were trying to do is say, okay, people like Iron Man because of this, people like this because of that. We'll just put that in the same movie. Um, or you get Iron Man two. Wow, that was a great movie, Iron Man. People loved it. So what what did they like about it? There was Iron Man. You like Iron Man? Now there's a hundred Iron Men in it, and it's like, wow, you're going the wrong way. You got enough Iron Man in it. Let's let's make another character story that just happens to have Iron Man in it. And I think, again, Indiana Jones. This guy's just living his life, you know. And uh, exactly, he has a passion that he's following, and that's it. That's the crux of it. And it takes him on adventure rather than you know this heavy-handed tripe that we see in most modern cinema. It it really feels to me like one they're either cashing in for money. Or you get the other end, what you see in the Academy Awards, movies nobody ever wants to watch that are serious and sad and so boring, eight-hour just just garbage. And, uh, it, you know, they're just spoon-feeding you heavy-handed schlock, emotional schlock, and then they get the Academy Award, and then no one ever sees the movie ever, has no clue what it is or cares. So and it just seems like somewhere between those that pendulum of – extreme crap on both ends there has to be some some good art left in there and uh occasionally you get a gem that kind of spits out and to your point it's always a passion driven project i got zero dollars i got a handful of nickels and i gotta make a movie so i gotta call in favors i gotta make sure there's no wasted scene no fat on the bones the character it laser focuses you and uh whereas if you have this big open just this endless bag of money and egos, well, then it becomes about that. It becomes money management mixed with uh, 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 herding cats, which are these actors and talent and, and things like that. So, you know, you got, you got a room full of rich narcissists trying to make something, which never works. It never works. It never, ever, ever works. But it just seems to be, it just happens. That's how entertainment happens. When there's money, I made one property that made some good money and that was wild blue yonder. And I ended up having to sell it. I just sold the IP uh, because I couldn't deal with success brings a lot of vampires and they're everywhere in entertainment. And that happens to good projects as well is the vampires start smelling money. And then suddenly, you know, you have seven producers that are making you put YouTube stars in your effing movie. And you're like, uh, this isn't why I got into this, man. You know, so right. right. Uh, How Zach Howard feels about the Hollywood industry 101. Please take your seats. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I do. I do want to take a moment here. Philip Jean Pierre chimes in. He has a question saying, "Speaking of character for you, Zach, which comic book character did you feel truly invested in?" Uh, it would the most invested I've ever felt in a character was Tug from Wild Blue Yonder, and we got hate mail, which actually it was a positive because we had to kill that character. But I remember there's a three-page sequence where I had to kill him. And uh, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Uh, it just, I was listening to, like, going through my old Pixies catalog, just listening to all my Pixies again, because they had a new album out. And it just created this beautiful, it was this beautiful, morose setting kind of uh, it, in my soul for him that I think kind of set up for me killing him. And, and, he had to martyr himself to redeem himself and how he did it. Mike Rich just wrote the most beautiful scene. And I tried to bring 
I just remember it just affected me for years that I, I almost like I killed a real person. And, uh, he hit that. So I'd have to say, uh, it, tug, tug from wild blue yonder. Those that read it will know it, it broke everybody's heart. Um, but it's just part of the story. When you're telling stories, you have to do certain things, uh, for the character and, uh, the character could not redeem himself without sacrificing his own life for everyone and how Mike wrote it. Just, he was the every man, which is odd. Cause he didn't, he, he didn't have the flashy, uh, uh, abilities of scram in the story or the coming of, well, although he had a coming of age story, he wasn't the star like Cola, the girl and her dog in it. And, uh, cause it was very much a Miyazaki story. Um, uh, it's coming of age of a young woman, but this character is how all viewers got in, all readers got into the story. They basically became tugged vicariously to be introduced to this world. So when we had to kill him, it was rough, man. It was really rough. It was, it was really rough for me. Oddly enough, usually I like when they have me killing characters. I'm like, oh, cool. We'll just have them explode in a blood mist. Um, and I never have to draw them again. Um, however, this one to this day sticks with me, man. So sorry. Thanks, Philip. And, uh, sorry for the rambling thing and sorry people. It isn't like the Hulk. I did enjoy drawing the Hulk. Uh, Spider-Man oddly did it for me, even though, you know, I was kind of doing, uh, all ages stories. It really, that was one of the only things I'm like singing the Spider-Man song while I'm drawing. You kind of feel like a kid, you know, I couldn't do it full time, but doing a few books here and there was a lot of fun. So those go. are my two, one indie and one uh, 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 mainstream. There you go. There you go. And once again, we are talking with comic book veteran Zach Howard on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Zach Howard, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat whether you're watching this live or on the replay. Thank you so much for being with us. Zach, when did you specifically decide to become a comic book writer or artist? Uh yeah, I got out of the Marines and I went back to college and I wanted to take drawing. I think when I was a kid, you think, you know, oh, I want to do this. But there's no like avenue into it, especially before the Internet. It was just this mysterious thing that always came out. You didn't know how to get into comic books. I had no one to talk to. So that dream just kind of withered away. Uh, uh, I did so well my first year of college. Uh, uh, the Marines recruited me, thought I'd be good for catching bullets. So after I failed out of college, I went into the Marines. Uh, when I got out of the Marines, I went back to college, and college was super easy. But when I started college, they didn't have any drawing classes. I wanted to get into drawing, but they had, like, sculpture and ceramics. So I took that. Next thing I know, a few years later, I'm a professional uh, ceramicist and was paying for college literally by making vases and selling my sculptures and competing on fine art circuits. Um Regardless, anyway, so I was doing well in college with uh, pottery and sculpture. Uh, my thesis year of college, I had to take one more class and it ended up being illustration. And the professor had done one. He had had one thing that he did, a real thing in comics, and that was Aliens versus Predator. But that was the first comic pro. I, I was like, whoa, just teach me everything. <coughs> Excuse me. He dragged me along to Megacon and made me show off my schoolwork. And I got a good response. Uh, so uh, my girlfriend at the time, uh, now wife, I just said, hey, we're both graduating. I know I made really good money for college. I like bought my own truck. I paid her rent. You know, a lot of crap, rare stuff for a college kid uh, with all my sculpture. I was very fortunate. So it was a big chance. I was like, if I go this route, it's going to be years before I get hired. Um, cause I, I wasn't a professional illustrator. Hell, I, I was a sculptor. So at 24, I had to like get serious about drawing and really learn how to draw. And my wife was very, I was very fortunate. She let me be almost unemployed for two years. Um, and as at the end, all I could get was gaming manual stuff for Steve Jackson games, but it taught me how to be a pro because they'd need a pirate with a knife, this drawing and a train, the next drawing. And then, uh, uh, universe exploding the next drawing. So he never really it taught you how to be professional, like a hired assassin, learn to draw anything and also make the client happy. So while I was kind of getting paid to, to do that, not paid a lot, but uh, paid somewhat to be professional artist, um, that company got the rights to Hellboy. And this is when Hellboy was first starting to get popular, right before the first movie. Um, they had the role-playing game and Mignola chose me and a guy named Peter Bergting 
to draw the resource manual. So I got to draw the comic book in it and a whole bunch of, you know, just static resource manual shots for the game, the GURPS game of Hellboy. That immediately launched me into a few side projects. And then within, uh, by the time I was like 28, I was drawing uh, Batman or a little 28, 29. Uh, so I, I right away got Detective Comics. And that's that was always like the pinnacle. People are like, if you get that, you're the cream of the crop and your career's set. And so I was all excited. But after doing a few books, I found myself very, very unhappy in that setting. It, it was, uh, and, and not to disparage anyone, it was just a fuck. Oh, sorry, it was a factory setting for me. Apologies, everyone. Uh, I was going to say farking. Uh, didn't know if that offends people's ears uh, to fark. Um, but uh, anyhow, uh, uh, I just was miserable. And I remember my inker telling me, I didn't, uh, inker didn't look good on me. We just, styles, I tried so hard and I was so miserable. Um, it's just everybody was just kind of hammering paychecks and did not care about the book at all. So, you know, rough lesson, we're doing commercial art. So disillusion, I decided to finally quit after, I don't know, eight months or something, uh, doing several books for them. And uh, I was told my career was over. Uh, and then I, I thought I was going to do one more show and I thought I'd go get a master's in film or something. And I was at a Chicago event, a wizard world and a very young green two weeks into the job, Chris Ryle who had taken over IDW, who at the time was a super dinky art book company, asked if I wanted to do a zombie book with him. I said, sure. Uh, on a whim, I was like, I've never done zombies, and it's an indie book, and I'll try it, and then leave comics. And that ended up being Shaun of the Dead, which was about as, I, well, you probably know, that was quite a famous uh, book and movie, and the book was in print for 14 years, and it kind of launched, relaunched my comic book career as uh, a dual creator, then I could do both. I jumped around between independent stuff and superhero stuff to pay the bills, then aliens, and then I just got obsessed with making my own stuff. And that went into Wobbly Yonder, uh, doing the cape for Joe Hill, um, the sequel to the cape, uh, and all the odds and ends uh, that I do because I get bored so easy. I usually just migrate from job to job. Um, and then uh, uh, Hellboy happened. And then COVID, so I kind of was on hold during that, and now uh, we're doing Moonshine Bigfoot. So uh, uh, I've kind of, I've had a weird, convoluted career, uh, and it's mostly just the boredom. I can't, I can't draw 10 issues of Wolverine doing things. I have to do a few issues and move on, or one shot and move on. Uh, and that's one thing I think that's always degraded my at least the fame part of my career i don't have problems getting work or being offered things but i'm also not a fan name uh even though i've been doing this 23 years and i've had some very fortunate successes so that's one detriment i've kind of uh brought on to myself is uh not sticking with one title for very long i get bored absolutely absolutely and what would you say are some of the rewards about being a comic book writer or artist Oh, free trips, because we don't get paid a lot. Uh, so I get, I mean, I, I, I was at Africa Con last year, and then for a full week they sent us on this uh, safari, uh, the National Kruger Park. Uh, They're one of the biggest preserves on planet Earth. Well, I got to stay there and my wife with a honeymoon bungalow. So we have like a, I don't even know, a $10,000 vacation we just get for coming out to Africa and doing their show. So things like that, getting to go to France and Chile and Nice and traveling the world, I'd say, is the absolute biggest perk of this job is because I like seeing the world. I grew up traveling around the world. And now whenever I go someplace cool, I just buy a ticket for my wife, too, and we get a mini vacation. Though it's, it's never a clean vacation. We still have to work. I get Again, I would have never made it to the Kruger in South Africa and been treated the way I was. And people... It, People treat you very nicely sometimes when your talent that's cut flying in for that. And that's my favorite part of it is meeting people from different places and seeing their culture. That's what I'd say is number one. There you go. And one, and Zach Howard is our guest on this week's episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Zach Howard, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Whether you're watching this live or on the replay, thank you so much for being with us. On the opposite side of the fence, though, Zach, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges about being a comic book writer or artist? 
the isolation, you know, like I, I've been working, I have a nice office, but it's in my basement, you know, and I work here 10 to 14 hours a day, which is, you know, it, it, it's great working on your passion, but it does get very, very lonely. And I, even though I'm, I'm a, I'm a level 99 isolationist, uh, uh, there's a certain aspect, you miss that camaraderie that, and that's why conventions sometimes are so wonderful because you get to see, oh, people will actually exist and read my books and I'm signing for it. And they seem happy that they, they had my book. And even better on top of that, you get to uh, uh, rub shoulders with your, your buddies that you only see once every few years. And uh, uh, that's the most beautiful part. Uh, I'd say the pendulum from the isolation. I, I just work by myself and the whole world is kind of abstract at that point and it eventually breaks it down. It, it, uh, it becomes a prison cell drawing your book and being paid to draw your own book eventually becomes a prison cell and you got to mitigate that healthily. And a lot of people do it in different ways. Uh, uh, I prefer working out and, uh, 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 jogging with my dogs and stuff. But if you don't have that constant release, whatever it ends up being, watching binging movies or whatever it is you gotta you gotta soak in the sations of yourself in a healthy manner i mean don't start doing crack at least i'd strongly advise not to but a lot of people do mitigate i know a lot of people that mitigate with alcohol and drugs and i'm not opposed to alcohol and drugs but they shouldn't be a crutch for your passion to get through it and so if there's if that's what's happening you gotta admit it you have to figure it out I've seen a lot of people crash and burn in one way or another. They flip out online just having a bad day or a bad moment, and it ruins their careers. Um, they get lost in the end of a bottle and uh, drink themselves you know, to death and just become these old curmudgeons that you see at a show, and they're just these withered, bitter men. And uh, so you got to constantly fight that entropy of setting yourself with micro kind of dopamine things and rather build – a structured system in your life that mitigates the isolation and the, I mean, it's not uncommon for a comic book artist to work 70, 80 hours in a week. And it, it sucks because we make as much as a school teacher and uh, which also sucks so that we pay them so low, but you, you, you gotta, you gotta to be able to maintain a healthy approach to, your passion, i.e. creativeness, whether it's writing, drawing, producing, whatever you do for comic books, music, whatever art form, you have to find a counterbalance. Your life has to balance. Otherwise, it just gains momentum. And next thing you know, you're screaming hateful things online while half drunk. And you wonder why you can't get your Deadpool job anymore. You're drawing, you know, Captain Frogman or something like some terrible side project because nobody wants a, a bitter curmudgeon, a volatile bitter curmudgeon uh, drawing their favorite title. You know, they want somebody like Ryan Otley, who's in a good mood and ex is exciting as his artwork is exciting. You want those positive people and, you know, you know uh, expressing your books, I'd say in the most part. Um, so it can be very easy to fall into the darkness of isolation and working in a niche field where you don't get a lot of rewards as far as like money and true accolades uh, because it's such a niche form. So being healthy is the number one challenge I would say uh, in working with this mm -hmm. and all the groupies. I can't take it, dude. Just always beating them off with a stick. They wait outside my office in a line. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, you'd think in the suburbs it wouldn't happen, but it does because comic books are that awesome. Wow. Fun facts <laughs> we're learning here on this episode of And I Quote. But with that, <laughs> gee whiz. Well, where can we go from here? We can only go up from here. right? No, we're actually- Let's go gonna, up, sir. Hold hands. Let's go gonna, up. We're going to go up. Maybe not so much down, but I do want to share something with you. This is a cover for something known as Hellboy and the BPRD, The Return of Effie Kolb. So I'm just curious. And for those of you who are listening, we're looking at the cover of Hellboy from, I believe it's Dark Horse Comics. So how did this all come about and what was it like working with Mike Mignola? So this is actually my second Hellboy thing. So I did the resource manual and it broke my heart. Uh, it, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, but broke my heart at the time. So I did the resource manual 
I knew I was a green artist. I wasn't very good. I was a sculptor learning how to draw. So it wasn't perfect, and I knew it. And Mike Mignola hired the other artist on the project to do stuff for him after it, and he didn't hire me. So that kind of broke my heart. But what it also did is it lit a fire under my butt. And I told myself, and I meant it, that if I ever get a shot again, I'm going to I'm gonna blow this out of the water like nobody had ever seen. I'm going to... I'm going to curl Mignola's toes and uh, just put that on the back burner and used it as fuel. I think it's really important to find creative thrust. And sometimes that's not getting what you want. It makes you work harder if you're smart uh, and dedicated. So I did, and I got much, much better. And then after I finished the sequel to the Cape with Joe Hill, um, Mignola called me up and asked if I would, he could write me a Hellboy story. And I was like, sure. And he's like, Corbin's too old now. And he was failing in health. And uh, Mignola's favorite story was The Crooked Man that he did with uh, Richard Corbin. And he asked if I'd do the sequel. And I was like, sure. And it was basically, ah, I like how you draw trees. What if I write a story with Mignola walking around the forest for two books? And I was like, um, I'm in. I don't care. Uh, and it ended up being a beautiful, beautiful story. I was very honored uh, because I think... It was his favorite. This is the sequel to his favorite story. So I, I took took it on, and it was during a chaotic time, I think, for Mike, too, because that last movie was coming out and it was not being received well. So things were a little tense at the time, and COVID was hitting. Um, but I just kept my nose down, and I I did my best. And my claim to fame on that one, don't tell Mignola anyone, is that I asked if I could do some covers too. And they're like, sure, make you the B cover. And that cover you just showed, after I drew that one, they made it the A cover. Mignolo is actually the B cover. So uh, that's my my big, uh, that was a little notch in my hat. So I went from him not wanting to hire me to they my cover usurped his in, in the catalog. So it's a little victory, uh, but uh, it meant a lot to me. And I did it very well, Mignolo gave me very kind words about it and it finally got collected. And now the newest movie that they're in pre-production right now for is the crooked man. So my book is actually the sequel to the next movie. Pretty cool. Oh my goodness. So <clears throat> yeah, pretty neat. But uh, having Mignola call you back 17 and a half years later and, and uh, ask you to draw something he wants to write. That's very special to him it meant the world to me and I took it very, very seriously. I put more, I put a lot of fuel and I burned a lot of calories on that one, even though it's only two issues. So hmm. very proud. Wow. Everything comes full circle. Hmm. Uh, if you work, it will life serendipity only works. If, if you're prepared for it, it's not serendipity. If you don't have the skill set and wherewithal to recognize it. So, I think it's a good lesson. Put stock in yourself rather than be bitter. F Mike Mignola. He didn't choose me. I was like, okay, let's, uh, you didn't choose me. Watch this. It may take, it may take a long time, but I'm going to come back. And when I come back, I'm going to be a MF and wizard. I'm going to be a wizard with like ninja swords and doing backflips around here. So, uh, and that that's all you can do is control your own. You can control your own fate. So I, I knew I wasn't good enough. I wanted to be good enough. So there's the chasm. So I just connected the dots there. And I was like, I'm going to one day be badass. And and you just keep your head down. And you got to be thoughtful and dedicated. And anyone can do it. Again, I didn't start drawing till I was 24 people. Not seriously. And I was drawing Hellboy two and a half years after that. Whether good or not. It was good, bad, everything in between. I was drawing F and Hellboy. And that lot. So all these people that are... They don't think they have the chops or anything like that. It's just a decision in your head. That sounds really ridiculous. But if you have a truth, you need to make a reality. It's just just a decision. It's like climbing a mountain. Yeah, it sucks. But you, if you saw somebody else climb that mountain, it means you can too. And that's what I'd like to impart to people is just you got to not only believe in your ego. Oh, I'm worth more than this. You got to prove you got to be willing to prove it to people. And that takes you got to you got to burn some some calories, a little elbow grease. Mm. 
the more you know. There you go. So once again, we're talking with comic book veteran Zach Howard on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Zach, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. And whether you are watching this live or on the replay, thank you so much for being with us. So we're going to go from Hellboy to something else because you got a new project that's out now. you got a brand new Kickstarter that's blown up the interweb. So let's take a look at that. I bet you've heard a lot of tales about Bigfoot. Well, now it's time to set the record straight. Because we do things a little different here in Buzzard County. In this here story, the heroes are outlaws with hearts of gold and tanks of gas. These fellas might seem reputable, but they're bona fide retrobates. Sheriff's crooked as a dog's leg. Walter ain't bad. And the rest of these folks, well, hell. They're as weird as they come. Sean Bigfoot, the greatest cryptozoological action adventure comedy of all time. Let's do it. He whiz. So, Moonshine <laughs> Bigfoot, what is this and how did it all come about? So, uh, it's uh, my latest comedy. I haven't done a comedy since 2005 with Sean Murphy, I think, or real comedy, uh, creator-owned comedy. We did something called Outer Orbit, which the end of last year suddenly got real hot and I was in movie negotiations for an animated movie, even though it was like 15, 17 years old. And uh, I was thinking to myself, uh, when was I think that might have been the last time I truly had fun while working on a book. Usually they're just grinds. They're worth it. You're, you're working for a goal to finish a book and people be happy and all that stuff. But I just miss laughing while working. And uh, uh, so uh, this was an idea that uh, an actor friend of mine had named Mike Marlowe, who's a theater actor here in Denver and, and uh, writes screenplays. Uh, we were coming back from a convention and hour 14 through the mountains of the drive uh, delirious, we were kind of bitching and poo-pooing like modern cinema, like let's just remake Dukes of Hazard 8. And they try to just retread a tire rather than make a good story movie in contemporary times, uh, capturing the feel of the first one. So I was making fun of it. And I just said, well, if you're going to remake Dukes of Hazard, do something fun, like have Bigfoot driving the car or something. And a million jokes later and six months later, we had, uh, I think a really good polished IP. And, uh, I, I just decided I put my other project, which is my opus that I'm working on right now, uh, aside, it's a heavy handed 450 pager, uh, because I wanted to have fun and come. I wanted to just enjoy going to work and we had a phenomenal crew. Uh, I, on a concept drawing and a write up image, Signed it right away. Uh, luckily, my legacy helps with that a little bit. But uh, I knew I had something. We kind of had lightning in a bottle. And, uh, uh, yeah, we just wanted to do something fun. Uh, and that's how Moonshine Bigfoot came about. And it just started writing itself. Uh, it's, for people that don't know, it's it's kind of a, it's a loving satire of kind of like 1980 Americana. When the world, world and, and media... <clears throat> or pop culture is a little bit more innocent at that time, whether perceived or, re uh, uh, you know, a false reality. Duke's a hazard. You didn't know who the hell General Lee was. And you didn't know about the terrible, you know, representation that say like the Dixie flag represents the articles of confederation. You just watch these two goofballs out running the law in the backwoods and cars jumping and, you just kind of accepted these simple kind of high concept things, tongue in cheek, and you just were in and out. It was nothing too serious. And it kind of lit up, or at least my childhood, all these shows that you don't know carry this uglier baggage on them. So we're trying to capture that feel 
of an innocent kind of fun time in pop culture in Americana um, without getting heavy in the geopolitical crap or, or overtones of uh, that with all the society ills that we have nowadays. Um, so we're kind of re repurposing, re kind of polishing Americana about that, that time, whether it's BJ the Bear or Knight Rider or A-Team or or the goofy music that was working. I'm sure all of it's Coke-filled. Coke but uh, we're 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 getting past that and just trying to uh, just take the magic of the time uh, uh, without the weight of today's social issues and just have a fun adventure. And I think we we came up with a lot of really heartfelt, endearing characters to take you through this wacky world. And mm. That's Moonshine Bigfoot. It's a Giddy love up. story. It's a love affair with with the innocence of 1980 Americana. Like no. Ronald Reagan's in it. He's a ch he's an escaped Chuck E. Cheese animatronic uh, pizza singing uh, thing that they've repurposed as President Reagan. And he'll our just background noise of our book is fun. He'll be giving like UN speeches and then stop and go into a twenty minute pizza deal song, and everybody is just politely clapping at, at the UN. And then he goes back into policy, and that's our world. We set it up in such a ridiculous way. Bigfoot is actually the skeptic, the, the most realistic part of our story. And that's kind of like the turn in it. Uh, Bigfoot's kind of like Scully from X-Files. Like, I don't know. I don't believe in that. That's not, I don't know about that story. And just, he's just a skeptic about everything, even though he's a walking, breathing Bigfoot. But mm. so. Well Congratulations on that. We wish you the best of luck with that Kickstarter moving forward. Do you have any other special memories for you from being at conventions or events, whether you are there as a vendor or there as an attendee? Like by what do you mean by special? Like something. Well, any other any other remember. memories? Whether you met someone in the industry or maybe you made friends with somebody that you didn't you didn't know you were going to work with somewhere down the line. It could oh. be anything. My number one favorite moment is when I was the Cape was super super popular with all the Eisner stuff going around, I got flown out to Edmonton Con. And this is, uh, I had a, an amazing show. And uh, at the end, uh, I had to be picked up like the ass crack of dawn because, you know, they have to take all the talent to the airport. So you, it doesn't matter if you have to wait five hours or five minutes, you're going on the, on the, the van. And uh, lo and behold, who's riding with me is Gwar, the band Gwar. The original members of the band Gwar. Okay, people look up Gwar if you don't know Gwar. They're about uh, they're a singular talent, whether you like them or not. They're about as unique, kind of fantasy-based heavy metal. And they have some good music uh, that I knew when I was younger. Uh, they have some great stuff. Uh, rock and roll never felt so good, etc. Um, but never really gave the band too much mind, other than they were fun. Lo and behold, they're huge fans of the Cape and Joe Hill. So we're in the Edmonton airport, which was like, with all that shale money, they just rebuilt the whole airport for like all 12 people in the airport. It's the size of, of uh, <clears throat> JFK. So there's no one in this brand new airport except, I swear, just Gwar and myself and the person checking us in. And we have like three hours before our flight. So we just start talking and walking around Edmonton airport and all this stuff. And uh, uh, just start having a great time. I've never laughed so hard. It's just so cool that these two members that are known for being the, the, the creators of Gwar, it was Chuck and Beefcake were the two guys. And uh, it's just the most fun I ever had for two hours, just, you know, farting around uh, the airport laughing with them. Okay, so I give them my sign books and give them to them. They're reading all my stuff on the plane. They're sitting like right in front of me. We're in like business class, and then first class is right in front of us. And uh, there's is a smaller plane, so there's literally one first class seat, and then it was business class. And the one first class seat, lo and behold, uh, 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 I'm not going to say who, but it was a a beloved Star Trek star sat down in it, which is fine. Rub shoulders in the green rooms. That's always one of my favorite things is getting to go to the green rooms in these big shows, and you learn your etiquette and. You meet all, I've met so many Star Trek people. I think I may have said Star Wars before. Star Trek, um, uh, which was huge in my early childhood. So it's always a huge fan. Well, this person, uh, 
I got to be careful. Nobody will know who it is, so I'll, I'll stay coy. Um, but this person was known for drinking at the show. I thought they were drinking water. They were drinking Smirnoff and mm-hmm. a lot of it. And that's why they had to be driven around in a golf cart because they couldn't walk because they're so messed up. Anyways, it's 11 in the morning, and this person wanders on the flight, sits down before the plane takes off, has two vodkas on ice. And I, I tell that story only because Gwar saw that. They turned and looked at each other with the eyebrows. And this is Gwar, who they have terrible things happening on their stage. Very, very grotesque stuff. And you'd think they're hard partiers. They looked at each other and looked at me and went, holy F. Um, uh, th- I just thought it was funny. A culmination that a Star Trek person out drank Gwar at 11 in the morning made them uh, take a step back. So, uh uh, maybe not the greatest story to tell. I apologize, fans, but that was my most seminal event as I got to hang out with Gore. Um, and they're really themselves and they were fans. There's been a few other times, uh, like uh, William Stout. I think, you know, he was uh, uh, one of the most famous, long term famous illustra- legacies in a, an American illustration. He used to work for the National Geographic and uh, all sorts of stuff documenting in Antarctica. Ant, art ant if i can speak <laughs> antarctica and uh uh had dinner with him a few times and i just pick his brain because he is one of the lead artists on conan the barbarian movie mm-hmm. so just learning all these stories about arnold and milius having conversations in the parking lot and and it, it's just really neat something that's connected to your life for 30 something years of and you memorized it and love it and it inspired you. And here's a guy telling you hands-on stories about being on the ground floor, meeting Arnold for the first time and uh, trying to draw him <laughs> and draw things for him. So uh, uh, that was pretty cool. William Stout and Guar. Choose your poison, fans. Boy, the things we hear on this show. Once again, we are talking with comic book veteran Zach Howard on this episode of And I Quote. Don't forget to like and share this episode with all of your closest friends. If you have any questions for Zach, let us know in the comments. Let us know in the chat. Whether you're watching this live or on the replay, we greatly appreciate it. I want to let you know that this episode of And I Quote is indeed powered by our good friends over there at Poddex. Now, Poddex are unique interview questions and episode starting prompts in the palm of your very own hand. So whether you are a new podcaster or existing broadcaster looking to grow your audience or get more engagement, you're going to want to check out poddex.com. Use code Ryan10, that's R Y A N 1 0, Ryan10 for 10% off your first order. You're not going to want to miss out on that opportunity. So, Poddex wants to know, Zach, what is one surefire way to grab your attention? Uh, if you grab like a series of glow sticks, uh, take all your clothes off and start doing cartwheels in front of me. I'd say you got a 50, 50 shot. Hmm. Okay. Okay. There you go. There you go. There you go. Yep. <laughs> right away. Right away. So <clears throat> pizza too. You can, you can walk by with good smelling pizza. That's my vice. Hmm. Uh, hey, there's nothing wrong with good pizza. Whether, it doesn't matter if it's any day of the week or twice on Sunday. Correct. So Poddex wants to know what is something you love that is vintage? Oh, uh, like vintage, vintage. Mm-hmm. Um, my favorite thing, vintage, would be uh, I I quit football my senior year of high school, and I spent. I hated the coach, and uh, I had always wanted a Mustang, so I ended up buying a, a for nothing a '67 Mustang. I would say is my favorite vintage thing, and I spent a year. Well, it ended up being nine years. Uh, anybody that owns a vintage car can understand that pain. But I spent nine years just rebuilding it and having uh, had a huge engine in it, big tires, like a big old dork. And uh, I drove that thing around America for a good nine years. Uh, so I'd say vintage cars are my favorite. Vintage muscle cars. I mean, Model T is cool and all, but, you know, I, I, I don't want to go bumping around the road like Grandpa. I'd rather have uh, something with 500 horsepower that can uh, – uh, driving those cars. I, I'm not big into cars like I used to be. I just have an old truck now. But uh, when I was younger, it's just – I swear it increases your testosterone while you're, you're just, just hitting the gas on those things. There's something neat about the vibration of a big muscle car. Mm. So that's what I'd say. Vintage muscle cars 
are pretty darn neat. Oh, well, there you go. And what would you do with an extra hour in a day? Oh, my gosh. Uh, is is uh, kitschy or is uh, new age hippie as it sounds. I live right by one of the biggest trails in Colorado. Uh, and I would just take my dogs out for an hour or more every day out into the mountains and nature preserves. It's, it's something, it, it's become my passion. I used to be a surfer and then I did MMA when I wasn't living by the oceans anymore, just to kind of get that chimp out of me that that's always, always building up, uh, of stress and anxiety and sitting on my butt all day. Um, the most cathartic thing on earth, I think, is just taking my dogs and uh, uh, going out and sweating in the sunshine of a Colorado mountain. Mm. So one more hour of that a day. Mm. Nature. I love it. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> good, answer, good answer to that question. Which actor would want to, would, or excuse me, let me rephrase. Which actor would you want to play you in a movie about your life? Oh wow, this is a new one. Uh, give me, give me one second here. Any actor in history? Yeah, living or dead, it doesn't matter. Living or dead. You can you can play with you can play with this question whoever you want. Um, I would say, uh, huh? I'm trying to be funny here, but I'm trying to find a, a funny angle. I don't know, man. I would get somebody that looked nothing like me. Like I would get. Uh, uh, remember the dad from Family Matters? <laughs> that's who i get winslow kevin winslow. winslow okay i was trying to think who was that character but yeah the guy that's a likable cop or and or dad in every movie while i was growing up i think, I think it was winslow wasn't it yeah. yeah i think it was winslow yeah 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 hmm interesting okay all right what gives you butterflies in your stomach and it could be anything uh PR things like this used to make me a little nervous because I'm a little introverted. Like I'm good live, but when you like sit me in a chair and I got to stare at a camera, that, that makes me a little nervous though. I've had that kind of, <laughs> that fear kind of burned out of me. Um, uh, man, I don't really get, I don't even get nervous around actors or anymore. Henry Rollins would make me nervous. Uh, he would, uh, he was such an important, uh, Guardo Camino, he was my baggage carrier when I was young, kind of my second father, as Joseph Campbell would say. And uh, uh, if to this day, if I met him, I'd have a really, really hard time. I'd probably be very quiet just from being afraid from squealing, crying and farting in front of him. Oh, my. Well, you, combo. yeah. No, it's okay. Hey, you answer these questions however you wish. But the good news is you've conquered your fear of being on camera and speaking with other people on camera, and you've conquered your fear of public speaking. So fear is not a factor for you. With that being said, I want to thank Zach Howard for being our guest on this episode of And I Quote. Zach, thank you so much for being here. Where can the individual who is watching or listening to this follow you on social media and everything that you have coming up? What do you got? So uh, you can just search for me, Zach Howard, on Facebook. But uh Instagram, I'm known as space friend underscore Z. Uh, that's that's for a lot of my social media, but that's where I am on Instagram. Uh, outside of Facebook and Instagram, you, you can just find it's really easy to find me with a any Google search of my name. Uh, I'm all over. I have a website. You'll see collector sites with my originals. Um, and that's about it. Uh, I'd say I'm mostly Facebook and Instagram, though. I'm an old man. So I can't have the talk. Otherwise, it's too much. Um, and that's about it. Uh, as far as uh, Moonshine Bigfoot, I'd appreciate if everybody went to inked.pub slash Moonshine Bigfoot or just go to Kickstarter. Um, we just hit our fourth stretch goal. You get 13 free comic books uh, downloads at the end of this campaign just for uh, uh, any level of support. So even a dollar gas money um, gets you... Eight free comic books. Uh, three of them are out of print, and two of them are, are old famous books that you just can't get anymore, uh, including my books, including Steve Ellis's books, Clara Meese out of print famous sketchbooks. So it's a pretty good deal, even if you don't like uh, uh, Moonshine and or Bigfoots. 
uh, and or phenomenal literature people, uh, you can still get free comic books just by supporting the campaign. So give us a look. And uh, I would appreciate each and every one of you for all time. Mm. There you go. Thank you so much, Zach Howard, for being with us. I will talk to you in just a bit. My name is Ryan of NeurCulture. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram, if you wish, at RyanRPM5. Also, check out all our previous episodes of And I Quote, all the previous episodes of some of the other shows that we've done, some of the things we got uh, coming up very soon. All the links are located within the description of this video, as well as our past videos of And I Quote. You can follow our past guests on their social media links and all that kind of jazz. Also, I want to let you guys know we're this close, this close to hitting 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. Once we do, we're going to throw a great big celebration that's going to include a live stream with returning guests, some surprises, as well as some exclusive giveaways we're going to have here on the show. But the only way we're going to reach that is by you telling your friends, and they tell their friends, and so on, and so on, and so on. You know how these things go. So make sure you're following us at Neuroculture Channel on all our social media channels. Once again, those links are located within the description of each and every single one of our videos oh that was a lot but you know what thank you all for being here we do greatly appreciate it once again don't forget to like comment share subscribe smash that notification bell so you get notified when our new videos go up and in the meantime stay healthy stay strong stay safe and remember life is better when reading take a look Famous Faces and Funnies in Melbourne, Florida is leading the way in pop culture fun. From comic books and graphic novels to Funko Pops and collector's items, Famous Faces and Funnies has it all. Rick Shea and the professional team at Famous Faces and Funnies are friendly and knowledgeable. Whether you're looking for toys, props, collector treasures, or a new comic book, Famous Faces and Funnies is your one-stop shop. To find Famous Faces and Funnies on Facebook and Twitter, just type at FFFComics. Flying action. Choose death defying escapes. Choose spine tingling thrills. Choose nail biting intrigue. Now's your chance to choose the adventure. The Captain Hawkland Adventures. Available on Amazon.com. You've worked hard and written a great book. Now, it's time to give it a great cover. If you're an indie author or small press publisher, Plasma Fire Graphics is your source for affordable cover illustration and graphic design. Plasma Fire Graphics, when the look of your book matters to you.
Good morning. Oh, and in case I don't see you, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. 